to the second day of XL Catlin Coral Live. Very, very um, happy to be here at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. And fantastic to have Kaylin Noyes um, here with us, who's the director of the Ocean Academy here at BIOS. Um, Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, director of Ocean Academy um, here in Bermuda. Uh, what does that involve? Um, so one of my roles here um, at BIOS is to bring ocean sciences to um, K through 12 here on the island. So we see students anywhere from the ages of 8 to 22 um, in different capacities from scuba diving and snorkeling all the way through to our robotics program and internships here at BIOS. Wow, I mean, it sounds like an amazing job to, to, to introduce you know, young people of all ages um, to the reef and, and the, the robotics program sounds fantastic. How did you get into this amazing role? That's a really good question. So one of um, my dreams as a little girl was to study the ocean. And so um, I grew up picking things out of the sand and swimming in the sea um, where I'm from in the US on the coast of New Jersey. Uh, and I decided to go to school for marine science and do a master's in um, conservation biology. Um, and during my undergraduate, I was able actually to come here to BIOS as a, a student for three and a half months. Um, and I fell in love with uh, swimming in the tropical seas versus the seas of New Jersey, though I do love the seas of New Jersey. Uh, and, um, and so I had an opportunity to come back here to BIOS to work with Dr. Dupuytron, who you all, maybe some of you spoke with yesterday. Um, and I worked with her for three months and I'm here nine years later. I, a lot wow. of luck and good timing and um, working hard here. And, and it's amazing to think that, I mean, just going down to your local seashore um, and that has then contributed to, to you coming to work um, here um, in, in, in Bermuda. What advice, because we've had a lot of schools from coastal US, what advice would you give to those young people um, who are sort of maybe edging down towards the shore but don't know where to take it from there? Yeah, really good question. And so one thing that I also had was incredible science teachers and they really helped to inspire me and give me direction on where to go next and what to study. Um, but I would definitely say when I was in high school, so when I was about 17 or 18, I volunteered at a lot of different organizations to get an idea of what working in that type of field would look like. And I realized some of the things I didn't like and some of the things that I was better at than others. Um, and so that was really helpful. And then when I got to university, my best advice for that is when you apply, um, is to really look at what some of the different professors are doing and what type of research they do. Because if they're primarily focused on undergraduates, then when you get there, you'll have opportunities to do research. And so if sharks are your thing, um, or if coral reefs are your thing, you really want to try to find a university wherever you are in the world that um, has professors there that are studying the types of things that you're interested in. Amazing. Um, so I, I know we're, I mean, we're going to be talking about coral a lot today and, and exploring the reef. Um, I, you, you've got um, a coral sample just here um, underneath the microscope. Perhaps we can, we can turn the, the laptop around and you can explain a little bit about, because um, we, we've seen these things on TV and in cartoons, these amazing reefs, but actually find out what they're made up of. Absolutely. So here we go. Let's turn it around, here. Spin it around as it were. Yeah. So what you can actually see under the microscope here is actually um, the yellow pencil coral. Um, and so the yellow pencil coral is one of our most common lab rats here um, at BIOS because we use it a lot because it um, doesn't produce a lot of mucus when we collect it. Um, and so what you're actually seeing um, is under the microscope being projected onto your screen. And what you're seeing is these little individual animals. Um, and when the light changes, you can actually see these little tentacles around the mouth of each of these individual polyps. Um, and so this is a colonial animal. So there's hundreds and hundreds of these polyps that make up this colony. Um, and they're able to secrete a calcium carbonate skeleton under their tissue. So it is a very hard rock skeleton. It's a very similar process to the way we make our bones. It's a biomineralization process. It's a little bit more complicated than that. But underneath their animal tissue, they actually slowly secrete calcium carbonate. And you can see as we've just moved the bowl just a little bit, they've retracted those tentacles. And so during the day, most of these polyps will have their tentacles down close to their mouth, and they will actually extend these tentacles at night to feed. 
Um, so the coloration that you're seeing in them is actually from a dinoflagellate algae, so a, a planktonic algae that lives inside their tissue. It's a microalgae. Um, it's called zooxanthellae. We call it zoax for short. Um, and they are largely what give coral its pigment. Um, and so these yellows and browns that you're seeing, um, a lot of that is due to the pigment of chlorophyll um, and other accessory pigments in the zooxanthellae itself. Um, and so they do derive a huge amount of their energy demand needs from these symbiotic algae, um, but they also will feed on phytoplankton at night. So these drifting animals and um, plants in the ocean that can't swim against a current, um, they have these specialized little spears they have cells called nidoblasts that are concentrated um, in their tentacles, and they can fire these nidae um, at um, uh, prey at night to actually feed and then bring these little, little tiny tentacles down into their mouths to feed. Um, and so that's another way that they meet some of their energy demands. But they basically have these little um, plant factories, um, like having a little vegetable patch living inside them versus having to go out to your garden to get vegetables to get the energy from the sun that these guys are producing. Amazing. I'm just going to turn, turn yeah. us around again so you can see us again. <laughs> no Here we go. Yeah. So I can show you what that skeleton looks like too. So di slightly different species, but also uh, a branching coral. Um, this guy is Oculina. It's called the ivory bush coral um, here in Bermuda. Um, and you can just see how complex the space is of that skeleton. So one of the things that corals provide is I consider them bioengineers. So they are an animal that makes a habitat. Um, in places where you all might be tuning in from, oysters are another really great bioengineer. They create these 3D spaces that lots and lots of organisms can hide in, find food in, and survive, and then reproduce and make the next generation. Um, and so underneath, so this is a dead skeleton, um, but the animal tissue is just like um, the slime on your teeth, really. It's like a very, very thin layer of animal tissue over the skeleton. Uh, and then continuously, they're secreting this calcium carbonate skeleton underneath, um, growing up and growing outward. Amazing. I know we've got some um, questions um, that we've, we've had sent through. Sure. Um, so just to, to, to look at a couple of them. Um, so this is we're sort of rather sort of bouncing all, all, all over the place in terms of um, coral biology and the wider coral ecosystem. So perhaps before we dive into talking about um, fish, how come that we when we talk about the reef we have this idea of all the fish and the other animals that live on it? What is it so that's so special about this this little creature yeah. um, that means it's, there's so much life involved? I do, that's a really great question. And to me, I think one of the most important things about corals is they do create this huge 3D structure. And so you can look and see all of these holes and crevices. Um, and so they provide, yes, a primary food source for some of the fish and some of the invertebrates. But if you think about um, how fish and other invertebrates rest at night, where do they rest? They actually rest inside these crevices of the reefs under overhangs um, where they kind of slow down their metabolic rate and sleep. Um, and so basically having all these shadows and holes and spaces to hide in um, allows for a great diversity of life. And I think that one of the reasons that this is one of the most biodiverse ecosystems on Earth um, is because of this 3D space that the corals provide. So by making these giant skeletons and making this matrix of spaces, um, it's basically a giant game of hide and seek. And there's lots of winners and lots of losers on the reef, um, but it allows for this huge amount of biodiversity to persist. Yeah, this is leading into, this is a, a question we, we had uh, um, from a school in Harrogate um, in Northern England. Um, do fish communicate with each other? How does this whole thing sort of work together? Yeah, so that's a really great question. And one thing that fascinates me a lot is that fish actually, so we see, um, you know, in our light spectrum, but fish are able to see actually into the um, ultraviolet light and uh, spectrum um, and so they're able to see these flashings of color um, that are quite different from what our eyes see when we go out snorkeling or scuba diving and we see them and so they're able to change what is their color pigment cells and their scales or um, chromatophores um, and so they're able to make flashes 
um, to communicate with each other. And they're also um, like something like a butterfly fish has a false eye spot on its back. Um, so it's much, much bigger than its actual eye to deter a predator to actually making it think that it's a lot bigger than it is. Um, and they also um, will communicate via sound. So there's a lot of interesting studies out of Hawaii um, looking at butterfly fish in terms of how they flick their tails and click against the reef um, in terms of their communication with their partner. Um, and so there's all kinds of things going on um, on the reef with sound and light and color um, that we can't even necessarily see with our eyes or hear even with our ears. Amazing. I've noticed we've got some more questions coming through um, very kindly from, um, sorted from the office in, in London. Um, but I think you've shown some examples of branching coral, but mm. there's so many different shapes of coral. There's brain corals, mushroom corals, bowler corals, you know, elkhorn, staghorn, all these different types of vase plates, mm -hmm. these names that are given to them. How come there's so many different shapes? Yeah. So let me give you an example of some of the more bolder corals that we have here in Bermuda. Um, so this is a brain. It is our mo by far our most common species here. We have two species. This is the grooved brain coral, but we also have the symmetrical brain coral, and they can grow, uh, I mean, I've seen them even three meters in diameter. Um, and so they are one of our massive covers of um, coral species here on the island. Um, and so what you'll see actually is when the animal itself starts to lay down that skeleton, it follows a very organized crystal matrix. Um, and so you can see these shapes and these grooves here that as it's laying down that skeleton, same way like an urchin lay, lays down its spine outward like that, they have a predestined pattern for them to lay down this crystal matrix. Um, and so they have a unique way to lay down the calcium carbonate. And so you get all of these very, very unique structures. So this one is the lesser star coral. So you can see those polyps are a lot, lot small. Well, they're, they're more well-defined in that they're circular, um, and you can see the way that it's laid down its skeleton here is quite different from the boulder coral. Now you have some corals that grow much larger than others, um, so that ivory bush coral, um, I mean, I have seen it like a meter and a half, two meters, these big, big, um, but you can see just how different it's growing up and out in these finger-like projections versus a big boulder like this. Um, and when they start to you know, be side by side, you can see at how many spaces that actually creates. Amazing. And, and is, is, is there a sort of a reason? Is, is there an adaptation of these different shapes? Do they suit different niches in the, in the marine environment? There is definitely better competitors. Um, so we have done a few student um, experiments. So at night, the coral reef corals fight each other for space. So they have mesenteries that they expel from their mouths um, that they can use to digest their neighbors. And they can also use those stinging cells, those nidae, um, to fire at their enemies. And so at night, they will compete for a space. And so some colonies are, some species even, are winners and are able to grow out large in larger masses, um, larger area, I should say. Um, and some, some, by their DNA fingerprint as well, will only be, say, the size of a softball. Um, but there definitely is reasons that these guys can grow so much larger, and a lot of it is due to their ability to compete here in Bermuda with other corals. Um, yeah. Brilliant. <laughs> and, I mean, in terms of coral diversity, I mean, for, for hard corals, it, it, it's quite low here in Bermuda. And, and, and we've got a question, you know, is there a single sort of, like, coral ancestor and, and would that have come from the coral triangle, this area in this sort of between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans where some corals are supposed to sort of have started? Yeah, no, you definitely would um, see an ancient ancestor in those hot spots there. Most of our corals that you're seeing here are Pleistocene, so they're about 1.8 million years old. Um, and so they're a lot younger um, than some of the corals that you'll see in terms of the ancestry in the coral triangle, but would have evolved from creatures like that. Um, what we know um, is the Bermuda pedestal would have been brought to the surface about 33, 34 million years ago. So if you think of that in relation to how old some of the Pacific reefs are, we're just, we're younger. Um, and, um, and so you will see single ancestors where they evolved from, but our species would be a lot younger and probably less evolved. And in terms of, of that, I mean, do, do we know what some of the sort of earliest coral species, I mean, are, do we, are they still extant or, or 
That's a good question. I actually am not sure in terms of the lineage of what would be like the most ancient coral, um, because I know what would have provided a lot of space at those times were shellfish based reefs, and okay. then it would have slowly evolved um, towards the coral animal. I would imagine something like a staghorn coral probably has one of the most ancient, but I actually don't know for sure. <laughs> wow, it's some, it's not something you stumped me. I don't know. Um, it, you guys are going to have to tell me. I mean, it seems it's almost a sort of more of a geology looking through yes. the sort of like fossil record than a yep. sort of biology question. And you can absolutely do that. And so these guys, they do lay down rings of growth, so you can kind of see those rings just here. And so they'll usually lay down here a band in the spring and a band, sorry, a band in the summer um, and a band in the winter with the summer being a bit bigger, um, thicker. Um, and so uh, you can actually take a core through um, a reef um, and actually look and do carbon dating to actually look at when that skeleton was laid down. So um, you can do a lot of that geologic work to try to figure out um, what would have been there a couple of million years ago. Amazing. We've got this a question coming through from Diane, um, which is about resilience to um, chemical and temperature changes. We've got this ocean acidification and, and thermal bleaching happening on the reefs around. The question here is about whether we, we enter into GM territory to, to breed more resilient corals. But I think some of the work that's being done here at BIOS is looking at, well, in fact, we might find those variations naturally and be able to take those. What, what, what's being done to sort of to help more resilient corals, you know, spread more and be able to cope with these future stresses? Yeah, so absolutely with different climate change scenarios, a lot of it has to do with the combination of stressors at any given location. So you could have chemical runoff plus really hot, warm days with high light levels and really calm because the calmer the water is, the further that light can penetrate and then you see proliferation of some leaching events and things like that. So it really does depend on a local level how many different stresses you have. Um, and there are definite winners and losers of these different scenarios. So you have species that tend to be more resilient against light and thermal stress, um, but even down to the actual zooxanthellae, that those actual symbionts that are inside the coral tissue, um, there's high, le high light level specialists, uh, A and B, um, and you have all the way down to plate, I think it's G or H now, I'm not sure where it stops yet. Um, but, um, and then, you know, things that have lower light tolerance as well. And so you'll see winners and losers even in the zooxanthellae clades. So it, because of the symbiosis, is it, it is really quite complex. And so you have scientists in the coral triangle and other places looking at the resilience of the zooxanthellae clades itself um, and, what, and how they're shifting. And during a thermal stress event, if they expel some and take in a different type of clade to make them more resilient, um, as well as um, looking at the coral animal itself and its resilience. But a lot of it really has to do with how much stress there is and how much they can tolerate. So they might be able, like with the Great Barrier Reef, they had a huge bleaching event previous and then another one this year. So they had two really stressful years back to back. Um, and that might be a, a point where some of those coral animal colonies do not, do not, aren't able to survive because of the re repeated stress. And other human interventions that we can do to, to support those um, polyp Suxanthellae combinations that are resilient to help them to get a wider foothold on, on the reef. Yeah. So there is a lot of different um, coral restoration programs around the world to try to propagate these corals. Um, uh, there's a lot of work being done. We had a guest scientist from Moat Marine Lab come and talk to us about fragmenting corals and then growing them up on larger tiles um, and cementing them out in the reef. Branching corals tend to be a really good one to fragment and to put out um, on the reef in these big coral gardens because uh, you can go out and clean them um, fairly easily um, and then put them in little plugs and kind of grow up like little trees. Um, and so there's definitely also species that grow a lot faster. Um, and so they tend to be favored as well for reintroducing that 3D space because one of the threats in, in some areas to coral reefs is dynamite fishing. Um, so the best way, well, not the best way, because it's not the best way, but the, uh, a way to collect lots of fish species um, is to put dynamite out on the reef uh, and it ruptures the swim bladders of the fish um, and then go through and collect those fish from the surface. And when that happens, you actually destroy this 3D space. So in those areas, um, restoration is one of the key 
to bring back that 3D space and branching corals are highly used for those types of restoration projects. Amazing. Um, we've, we've got a question um, from Sandra in Australia who's, who's going to watch the playback when she sure. <laughs> wakes, wakes up. Sure. Um, and and it's, it's asking about reversing coral bleaching. Is this something we can reverse or are we just trying to sort of stave off the worst impact? So um, I know that uh, Dr. Japutran talked a little bit about it yesterday. It is um, coral bleaching is a process of thermal stress as well as UV radiation from the sun. So you tend to get these big bleaching events when you have really calm, high, sunny, beautiful days, um, but also you have um, also high water temperatures. Um, and so you get the expulsion of these zooxanthellae, which, which actually leave the skeleton looking like this, or a pale uh, yellow color, brown color, depending on what um, type of zooxanthellae it makes up. At that point, there usually is accessory zooxanthellae still inside the coral tissue, um, and so they can actually bounce back from these types of short-lived events. Um, when you start to get um, algae actually growing on top of the skeleton, then you know most likely that that coral is not going to recover. Um, and so that's what you're seeing in places on the Great Barrier Reef now, is you're seeing an algae overgrowth of these coral skeletons. Um, and that means that from that perspective is that coral won't survive. But the, the part is the skeleton is still there. And the best place for a baby coral to settle um, is on a dead skeleton, or one of the best places. Um, and so if you have really healthy reef around and down current, it can actually bring those baby larvae um, up to actually recolonize those areas. It's just that that process is really slow, and we know these guys don't grow very fast. Um, and so that's where coral restoration sometimes is really helpful in starting to jumpstart those types of areas that um, might not have recovered from that type of thermal stress or so what, what, stress. what I'm hearing here is, is that if the, the bleaching event doesn't last for too long, Yes. then it's possible for the coral to recover mm -hmm. and for the, the succinctheli to come back. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, looking at the, the human impacts from a human point of view, that um, you know, the, the link of increased atmospheric carbon dioxide to the rising sea temperatures, is, and, and really is, is, is there a, you know, should, should we be changing our, our own behaviors yeah. To, to lessen the to potential sort of frequency and, and, and um, duration of these bleaching events. Great, yeah. So with, with climate change, we have you know two different CO2 problems that work in concert with each other. So you have CO2 being admit, admitted to the atmosphere, you know, natural ways that CO2 is admitted to the atmosphere, and then increased ways in which humans are emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. And obviously that's a, a big greenhouse gas. It's a heat trapping gas that basically uh, traps um, warm air in the atmosphere around the earth and so you're going to get warming um, on continents as well as on in the ocean um, and then your other co2 problem is you have that increased co2 and co2 is always diffusing in and out of the ocean um, but the ocean has this huge capacity to absorb co2 it's not finite but it has the ability to do so um, and so it can take in that co2 um, and what is happening over time as the ocean is uptaking lots and lots of that CO2 um, is that it's becoming slightly more acidic. Um, it's still on the basic side, actually, um, but that, that slight bit of acidity um, actually makes the carbonate ion, CO3, which is what combines with calcium to make these hard skeletons, less available. It doesn't mean that it's not there, it's just less available. So from a human perspective, things that we can do are, are, is anything that lessens our footprint in terms of the emissions of CO2 itself. Um, you know, simple things, even just from, you know, using your car less, um, unplugging your appliances when you're not using them, because believe it or not, you're still using electricity. Um, and electricity generation um, from, you know, large industrial level and from, you know, us just on a small level, like in this lab, are emitting CO2 to the atmosphere. And, and, and link, linking that, there's a question from, from George in Romania um, asking that we, we still seem to have a debate about uh, climate change and, and um, to a lesser extent it, it, um, its impact on the marine environment. Just, um, but that's getting more into the news as, as, as well. Yeah. Um, and, and yet people still think it's, it's uh, something, a, a point for discussion. Yes. Um, rather than something that a lot of scientists have worked very hard on to, to try and eradicate any other possibilities. 
how, how did you come to this decision makers? That do, 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 do we bring them all to at least three from the great area? <laughs> yeah. or how do we convince people that it's, this isn't a, something that we've made up? I definitely think that visual images are really, really important. So our ability to um, create the cinematog cinematography in terms of the experience of watching a coral bleach over time, which is what um, a lot of documentaries have been able to do in the last several years now that GoPros have become more prevalent. Um, so you know, those types of photographic images and video images are really powerful in politics. Um, for us here at BIOS, we speak with our science and our, our core here is really long-term monitoring of the ocean. So we've been monitoring the same site in the ocean since 1956 when Henry M. Stommel set up our Hydrostation S. Um, and we have a team that's also been monitoring since 1988. And we are unequivocally, unequivocally, that's a tough <laughs> word, uh, seeing um, a rise in carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and therefore partial, partial, uh, partial pressure of CO2 in the ocean is increasing. And you will see the actual pH of the ocean is decreasing without a shadow of a doubt. So we try to be on different um, panels for climate change and to publish as much as we can about the research that we do here at BIOS to say, we know that this is from deca decades and decades of research that this is happening in our ocean. Um, and this is how we can support your policy and, and what we think needs to happen for, for these changes to be made. Brilliant, and that really nice leads into the role of BIOS that leads into a few questions that we've had um, about just just a, um, just to start off with the the team at BIOS and, and the role that you play and, and, and it's sort of the, then the life of, of working. Yeah, that's a really good question. What's great about the, the Institute here is we have so many different expertise. Um, so we are a small um, oceanographic institute in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I mean, our closest landmass is 600 nautical miles away. Um, and so we really are isolated. We're the only bit of land above sea level in the Sargasso Sea in this big North Atlantic gyre. Um, and so we also have influence from the Gulf Stream. Um, so from a physical oceanographer's perspective, we have these really cool eddies that spin off of the Gulf Stream um, that keep our waters subtropical. So we get coral reefs, mangrove beds, seagrass beds, and we are the northernmost limit of that. Um, and so for a combination of our access to the open ocean, which are with our large research vessel, the Atlantic Explorer, as well as access to these um, inshore habitats um, make us an ideal location to study all these different things. So we look at the chemistry of the ocean, we look at the biology of the open ocean. So we have um, plankton biologists that look at the migration of these plankton in the ocean. Um, we have um, scientists that look at DNA in the ocean, bacteria and viruses, um, looking at this biological pump. So looking at um, carbon dioxide being dissolved into the um, ocean being made um, available organically to organisms and how that moves in the ocean, um, all the way to looking at fish and the corals itself that we're talking about today. So how much time do, do sort of people here spend sort of, you know, exploring out uh, on, on the reef or, or the open ocean versus in the lab versus paperwork and yes. things like that? <laughs> that's a good question. So we have anything, so for our time series, um, we have an atmospheric time series, and so that Tudor Hill Marie, uh, Air Observatory gets monitored weekly, and so we have a technician, that a uh, group of research specialists that would go out and collect that atmospheric data. Um, our ship will go out once uh, a month, sometimes twice a month during our uh, spring and fall blooms, and they will be at sea for anywhere up to four days. And then once they get back from sea, they'll be processing samples. So they'll do some shipboard, and then they have to process the rest of those water samples here at BIOS. For our inshore scientists, they most likely are spending all day on a boat. Um, and then for every boat day they have, that, that data they have probably takes a week and a half to two weeks just to analyze that one set of data. So a lot of it is data processing writing grants um, for new funding to bring in more different research questions to support research questions, um, and then uh, writing the papers that get that message out there so that we can communicate our science and we can help support um, different po policy changes. Amazing. Can I ask you the best thing and the worst thing about your job? Okay, it's a good question. The best thing. So I think the best thing about my job is I do get to teach scuba diving. I, I'm not a scuba instructor, but um, I teach already certified divers how to survey the reef. 
Um, so we are able to get into our scuba gear um, in the summertime, sometimes up to 30 dives a summer um, that I get to do with international uh, high school students as well as local students. Um, the worst part of my job um, would probably be uh, what Jamie was saying, the paperwork. Um, I have a whole lot of paperwork um, and I do spend a lot of time budgeting for our different programs. Uh, and that that's, I mean, that's probably the worst, which really isn't that bad. Um, I have a pretty good job. Um, but I think actually what people underestimate about science is the amount of cleaning that you have to do. <laughs> so for all of these water samples, and if you're working in a, D, you know, a lab working with DNA or chemicals, everything has to be sterile. It has to be clean. And so you spend a lot of time prepping to be in the field. It's not just the field day itself. It's getting ready, making sure everything's clean, ready to go, get out there, do the, some of the fun stuff, and then bring it all back and clean it all and get ready for the yes, next day. So one field day is really sort of two weeks work. Yes, exactly. Yeah, and for all of our you know more lab-based scientists, they're having to autoclave everything, make sure their lab space is completely clean, um, and for our students even as well. Um, when they're done with their dissection, everything needs to be totally clean. <laughs> wow. Um, and quick question here, uh, your favorite ocean, or should we say ocean basin, because there is only one ocean. Yes. Um, oh, that's a tough one. I have not been to the Coral Triangle, um, so Indonesia and diving like in Raja Ampat and things like that, it has been on my bucket list of places uh, to go and visit just because I've seen so um, so much diversity of uh, phot photography and video that has come through there. Um, I personally, although I, I love diving in Bermuda, I've also really loved exploring Baja um, in Mexico. They have, you know, just an amazing array of marine life and, and fish species, and that's been a, one of my favorite places uh, to visit as a, as a scientist. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> amazing. Um, so we've, we've got this question through again about threats to the reef, and mm -hmm. we've talked about these sort of system-wide threats, the acidification process and the, the, the thermal bleaching. Um, looking at Bermuda in particular, what are some of the more sort of local threats um, affecting the marine environment here? So we have um, two that I can think of. Um, so you'll be talking to, some of you might be uh, talking to a researcher later this afternoon um, about the invasive lionfish. And so it's an Indo-Pacific species that um, actually Chris Flip might have been talking about a little bit yesterday. Um, it is uh, native to the Indo-Pacific Indo area um, and has invaded um, all throughout the Gulf of Mexico, all the way up the East Coast, um, and and through the, throughout the Caribbean, uh, and it is a voracious predator, and so it preys on a vast number of our juvenile fish species. But even this past week, one of our scientists, Dr. Gretchen Goodbody Greenlee, dissected one of the stomachs and found a baby octopus um, and also a baby sh cave shrimp. And so we know that there's lots and lots of them, especially on our mesophotic reefs, um, but all the way up into the shallows. Um, and so it is one of our threats to um, the diversity of our coral reefs here uh, in Bermuda. Um, one of the other things that we've been looking at a lot is um, marine debris. And so we do have a marine debris task force um, that is a multiple organizations across the island. So as you meet some of our other researchers here in Bermuda, they might also be mentoring marine debris. Um, but some of our scientists have been looking at um, uh, accumulation of toxins on things like these nurdles. So nurdles, just to give you an idea, are these little tiny plastic particles. Let me probably put them in my hand. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, and they are the beginning of, so these particles, nurdles, get um, melted down to make your, you know, plastic water bottles and uh, all kinds of other plastic um, objects. And a lot of times, um, you know, crates are knocked over and they're discharged into the sea, or even as um, the processing is happening, lots of it get escaped into the groundwater and end up in the ocean. Um, and so we've had some of our scientists that have looked at the accumulation of uh, chemicals on these nurdles, um, and then all kinds of um, chemical accumulation on uh, marine debris that has, you know, basically trash. Um, that has ended up in the ocean. So you can kind of see there's some fish bites here on this uh, soap bottle. Um, and so these obviously get caught in um, either the intestinal tract of a lot of marine animals um, and can basically fake the stomach into thinking that it's full, um, but um, actually it's full of plastic. Um, and so a lot of times you'll get um, 
organisms that are not able to survive due to plastic ingestion. Um, but some of our scientists are even looking down at the very, very tiny level. So these little, little tiny planktons, like zooplankton, like copepods, if you watch SpongeBob SquarePants, uh, plankton from SpongeBob is a copepod. Um, and uh, they can ingest plastics. And you can look at the little, little tiny microplastics um, that are passing through their digestive tract. So those are just two um, of the threats that, that we have in, in Bermuda um, and two that we're working really hard throughout the island um, to try to work as a big team across many organizations to help that threat, mitigate that threat. And um, I mean, what, what, what I mean, we talked about plastics here. Is, is that something that um, is a is a government problem in terms of changing laws, or is it an individual habit thing that, that everybody can can work on, or maybe it's both? Yeah. Um, so a little bit of both. So some some of our trash, as we've been looking at it, actually doesn't necessarily originate in Bermuda, though we are polluters, just like every everyone else. We are creating. Um, and using plastic. And so anytime that you can cut down on your one-time use plastic by having a pl you know, having a coffee mug that you use every day um, or having a water bottle that you use every day um, or purchasing products that um, you know are not packaged with plastic um, is a really huge contribution to the amount of garbage that you put out by the curbside or out in the dumpster. And so anytime you can make that bag smaller by either composting the, all of your organic waste um, or um, mitigating how much plastic you purchase and use um, actually helps the, the whole the whole problem. Um, for us um, here in Bermuda, re recycling plastics is really difficult because we are in the well. It's not difficult, but it is. We're in the middle of nowhere, so we have to export some some of our waste. Um, and and so coming up with new innovative solutions on what to do about plastics here, but overall reducing our use of them is probably one of the most um, important ways to help mitigate that threat. Okay, great. Um, so a question that's come up quite a lot yeah. over the past day and a half, the Bermuda Triangle. Oh, that's a good question. What, how, where, and how does it affect your research? That's a good question. So we, we haven't had any, um, as far as I know, um, just because the beginning of the Bermuda Triangle actually starts offshore Bermuda and heads down um, towards um, towards Puerto Rico and then back up to the other side. And so it's actually quite far from the island itself where its GPS location is, is known to be. Um, I haven't heard of any of our research vessels having any problems with their GPS or their compasses spinning out of control. Um, there is um, a great, um, I believe there is one at the aquarium and zoo as well explaining the mysteries behind the um, coral triangle so maybe as the week progresses i might ask some of them because they they might know a little bit better about the triangle than myself but everyone always asks about the triangle uh, but a little bit further away from bermuda and and hasn't had a bit of impact on your work no not not to my knowledge uh, apart from triangles are there any other dangers um to exploring the reef Ooh. Um, so there's a couple of different, um, things that we tend to be more careful of when we see them. So lionfish, they do have venomous spines, which, um, Chris might, might have mentioned yesterday. Um, and so if you get stuck, um, with one of the lionfish spines, you're, it'll be in a lot of pain and your hand or your wherever will swell, um, quite a lot. Uh, scorpion fish, um, if we see them, but they're so well camouflaged, uh, sometimes you don't. Um, Coral scrapes. Yeah, coral scrapes. Um, so that's a really good one. If you get um, scraped by, you knock into a, a coral, um, you might get a, a gouge that you really need to keep um, antiseptic on because the mucus itself can cause um, an infection. Um, and we've had a few of those before as well. Um, I'm never really worried about, I would love to see a shark in Bermuda while diving. I have seen them from shipboard. Um, seen the seen a hammerhead, seen a Galapagos shark, um, seen a baby tiger shark, but I've actually never seen one while diving. So if I did, I think that that would be amazing. So some of the the, the dangers that people talk about the sort of uh, box jellyfish, sea snakes, crocodile, sharks, yeah. that kind of marine creature, not so much. Not so much in Bermuda. No, I mean we have eels and um, we have. Uh, 
a couple of other things, but I've never been terribly worried while diving in Bermuda that I would um, come into contact with something that I felt like I needed to use some sort of self-defense. And and then there's the, I suppose there's the dangers around actually just, we're not meant to be 10 meters underwater or 20 meters or however deep um, mm -hmm. that the research takes you. Um, what are some of the, what's some of the equipment and some of the, the sort of risks of, of scuba diving? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I can show you some of the gear and bring it in if, you, if you'd like. Um, and so basics, um, you start off with something that will give you some propulsion. Um, so these are your fins. These are full foot fins. Um, so you can put your foot all the way inside um, to help give you some propulsion because you're going to be wearing quite a lot of weight um, to get you down there. And I'll explain why you would be doing that. Um, but this allows you to swim faster, basically, by giving you kind of these frog-like feet. Um, you'll also have your basic mask and snorkel. Um, so you can see here, you've got the mask there. Um, and most scuba divers will still wear a snorkel just in case you come to the surface and you're out of air and you need to swim far, you have a snorkel. Um, a lot of them will have um, a back strap. We have a bias one there. Um, yeah. Um, and so those are the basics that you need to really start to look at um, what's under the sea is you need to be able to flatten out the water somehow. So any way that you can do that. Um, wetsuits. Um, so kind of like a polar bear's fur traps a thin layer of water to heat, heat it up. We have a wetsuit that does the same. Um, so water gets in it, it gets wet, it traps it close to your skin and warms up that water. So you have basically a little layer of heated water around you while you scuba dive. Um, and here in Bermuda, just about this time of year, we're all starting now to wear our wetsuits. Um, and then you have two other important um, pieces of equipment. This one is your buoyancy compensation device, or your BCD, and it is basically a vest. Um, so one of the things you can see is it has what we call dump valves, and so this is what lets air out, and you can let air out here as well. Um, and this red button here is your inflate button, which you only use at the surface to inflate your BCD um, when you come to the surface so that you float. So I'm just going to step back here and not trip on anything. And so this is how the vest goes on like that. Um, you have a cummerbund clip, a top clip here. Um, and what you'll see when I turn around is that is where my tank goes. So those are my tank straps there um, to actually attach my scuba tank. The other thing that I'll also be wearing is a weight belt, um, and that'll allow me to sink. Um, and so when I'm at the surface and I want to go down, I'll have all my equipment on, and I will have what's called a regulator in. So that is my regulator there that I breathe off of. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that will allow me to breathe underwater. And so when it's time to go down, um, you'll let air out of your BC, either from here or from your dump valve here, or you have one more right there. Um, and that will allow you to um, basically make yourself less buoyant um, and sink, and the weight belt will help you do that. When you get down to where you want to be, you might be giving yourself just a little bit of an inflate just to make sure you're neutrally buoyant in the water so you don't kick into the coral or land on them, and you can kind of just nicely float over the reef. Um, you do have a backup. Um, it's called an octopus, and so that's if for some reason something goes wrong with your primary um, air source, you have a backup, or you always dive with a buddy. Um, so if your buddy runs out of air for some reason, you always have something to donate to them. The other and last important thing that you have is you have a compass on there. You have a gauge that tells you how much air you have right there. Sorry, right there. And then you have a gauge that says what depth you're at. Um, and so we have different dive tables that we use to let us know how long we can stay down, at what depth for. Um, and if we're doing multiple dives, how long we need to sit on board the boat before we can go back and do another dive. Um, of course, the only thing I didn't show you was the tank. And that is scuba tank there. Um, and so you can see that it's got a mixture of different gases inside there. Um, and that is what we will breathe underwater. So some of the dangers of, of scuba diving is the buildup of nitrogen. Um, of course, it's a major component of the air. Um, and so when you're scuba diving, you have to do a certain um, 
your safety stops if you go below a certain depth, um, allow you to off-gas that nitrogen bubbles that are in your blood um, before you come to the surface. And so there's a lot of precautions that you learn when you're scuba diving on how to make sure that you're diving safely. And, and I mean, how much air do you take with you? Yeah, so a full scuba tank um, it's 3,000, well, it can go up to higher than that, but usually it's about 3,000 PSI, the, partial, the pressure inside. Um, so these are um, aluminum tanks, um, and they will, at 30 feet, actually probably give me about an hour and a half dive. Um, and so for, for most people, they're usually diving for about an hour. Um, and of course, the deeper we go, um, the more compression, um, and therefore the, the more air you're going to go through as you're breathing down at deeper depths. So that's sort of about sort of three and a half thousand liters of air that yes. you're taking with you. Wow. Yes. <laughs> Amazing. I mean, I think I think we're um, nearing nearing the the end of, of this call. Thank you so much, Hayden, for for sharing no all the, all those amazing insights. I mean, we we talked a little bit about um, advice to to budding young ocean explorers at the beginning. Do you have any final words? Um, for anyone wanting to, 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 to explore the oceans. Yeah, definitely just keep asking questions. Ask questions about everything, of, of the people that you see at the aquarium, the zoo, um, and get involved, um, because that's the best way for you to learn if this is gonna be a profession that you'd like to be in. Um, and there's, in your science classes, although it might seem kind of like, oh, procedure, objective, that scientific method that you go through, through all those experiments, is what we go through every time we get ready to go into the field. We have a set protocol, a set question that we have to answer, and the data that we have to support that question. And so that scientific method really is kind of the root recipe for success as a scientist. So the more that you practice it, um, and the more it means there's a vast array then of questions that you can ask and know how to then answer those questions. And so I would say keep being curious, keep asking questions, and get involved in your local community organizations to get an idea of what that field is gonna look like. Amazing, well thank you so much again. Thanks for having me. And thank you so much for all those who've taken part. Bye-bye. Bye guys. <laughs>